So, um, if you have looked in your bulletin, you, you can see my sermon title. It's a little bit long. Uh, so, just so you know, um, it's, it's all in the spirit of the Puritans. Uh, they love long titles for sermons and books and whatnot and lectures or whatever. But uh, basically the sermon title is just sort of an outline of where we're going today as we uh, study James chapter 5 verses 7 through 20. And it's interesting that um, one, of the, one of the things we're going to, to touch on this morning is not the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what we're celebrating right now, his first coming into the world, but uh, the expectation of his return also helps us to uh, live and be uh, the Christians that God would want us to be as, we, as he stands at the door, basically. So let's look together in, uh, in the letter of James, it's right after the book of Hebrews, if you find that in your New Testament. Once you pass Hebrews, you come to James, and then if you get to Peter or John, you've gone a little bit too far. But this morning, um, it is a long sermon title, but don't expect the sermon to be in, indicative of a long sermon. So um, uh, it, it should not be as long as any, or as others that I have preached before. At least you can pray to that end. Amen, I know, I knew I'd get some amens on that one. But let's look here in James chapter five, beginning at verse seven, where James writes these words. He says, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I don't know how that makes you feel, but I'm ready. If the trumpet blows and the, the angel shouts, I'm ready. Um, I hope you can say that with full assurance of heart that when the, the Lord calls you, you know, home, uh, your heart beat, beats that last beat and your lungs breathe that last breath, that you are ready. I hope you have that assurance. And then if not, that by the end of this time here together today, that perhaps you will. And so uh, James has been talking uh, about the arrogance of believers saying that uh, we're going to do this and we're going to go to this town on this date and we're going to stay for this long and we're going to do this business and make so much money and we're going to and James reminded us as we looked at last week you don't know how long you have to live you don't know what tomorrow holds I mean and we talked yet last week about how you know yesterday probably didn't go like you thought it would and today might not have even happened like you thought it would so far and you, we just don't know what each day holds, but we know that if we're in the hands of the one who holds each day, that we're gonna be all right. Amen. And then he talked in the first part of chapter five about the rich, people that were using their maybe place in the church or their um, position in society as a way to get rich and not use their money the way the Lord would have them to use their money. Use their money to bless people, not to hurt people. And, and so as, as we remember those things from previous weeks, I think what James is getting to here as we start in verse seven, he says, therefore be patient brethren until the coming of the Lord. In other words, rather than gain the whole world and lose your soul as Jesus taught, a righteous person should be patient. Don't think you have to rip people off. Don't think you have to be a miser. Don't think you have to hold everything or, or be greedy. He says, just be patient. Have a long view in mind instead of the short term. Uh, be patient, be long suffering, wait upon the Lord. 
Don't rush. Don't be in a hurry. God will come through for you. You can trust him. And so be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. So James is reminding these people, he says, do what you know is right to do. That's what the end of chapter four talks about. Therefore, to him who knows the good to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. So you need to be about doing what you know is right to do. Do that and trust God with the results. If you get rich, amen, but use that for his glory. James says to be patient and wait until the coming of the Lord, like the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, I don't know a lazy farmer. I mean, I've never met a farmer who was lazy. Those are some of the hardest working people on this good earth. And so when you think about a farmer waiting for the crop to come in, he, he is not someone who just waits around, who just expects something to happen for doing nothing. A farmer works hard. A farmer plants seeds and tills the ground and fertilizes it. And he waits patiently for the rain to fall. And so like the farmer, we need to be patient and wait upon the Lord to do only what he can do and only what he should do for you. Don't try to force his hand. Don't try to manipulate people to get what you want. And don't even use God as a means to an end that you want. Because if you're doing that, you know what? You're not focused on God. You're focused on what God can give you more than you are on him. You're choosing the gift over the giver of the gift. And you're idolizing the end and not the one who is the one who gives the good gift. So he tells us here in verse 8 to be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So he says, uh, you know, back in those days, it seems like these early Christians thought that the Lord could return at any time. And I believe he could, especially now. I mean, we're 2,000 years closer, I think, to the coming of the Lord than we were back in those days. But, but I think the point James is making here is that we need to always be ready when he returns. What will he find us doing? Will he find faith on the earth, Jesus said. So what is it that you have left undone that you should do? What is that good thing that the Lord has called you to do you maybe left undone? What is the good that you know you should have done but not done? And in verse 9, he talks about relating to each other. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And I don't know that James necessarily means that Jesus is right there at the door. He's ready to open it and come right in. I think he's saying that Jesus is at the door and he can hear exactly what you're thinking. He knows exactly what you're, what's in your mind. Don't grumble against one another, brother. Is Jesus hearing you grumble? Uh, on Christmas Day, when your children or your grandchildren or you open those presents and you don't get what you want, are you gonna grumble? Don't grumble, don't grumble. Uh, so stop grumbling about other people too. And isn't that what we do? Often we're like, look at so-and-so, look at what they're doing, or look at what they're not doing or whatever. And, and we have a problem with them. And maybe, maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe there's some reality to, you know, they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. But stop grumbling about other people, about one another. Brethren, he says, lest you be 
condemned. Stop meddling in their lives and being so picky and so judgy about them. Get your own life right first. Get it straightened out. Make sure you're right with the Lord, lest you be condemned. Didn't Jesus talk about that too in the Sermon on the Mount? How can you get the speck out of your brother's eye if you've got a log in your eye? First, get the log out of your own eye so you can see to get the speck out of your brother's eye. If you're focused on other people all the time, and you neglect yourself and your own spiritual needs, and your own spiritual condition, you're gonna have problems. I mean, it. Jesus, he says, is standing at the door. He's, he's the judge, he's right there. He knows what's going on, like it or not. We can't hide from the Lord. Now that's a comforting thing for a lot of us. Praise God, he knows what's happening in my life. He knows what I need before I ask him. He knows what's going on and he knows the, the problems and the sorrows and the struggles that I'm having in my life. And that's a comforting thought for us who know him as our Lord and Savior. But for those who don't, that could be a terrifying thought that the Lord knows everything I think, that the Lord knows what I've been doing with my life, that the Lord knows what's going on in thought, word, and deed. Well, that's why you need the Lord. That's what we did. We figured out, we understood that without him, we were without hope and we needed the Lord. And so we, at one time, we trusted in the Lord as our savior and he's changed us to where we're comforted by the thought that the Lord is there and he knows what's going on. He knows our thoughts and he hears us every time we grumble. And the Bible says we will give an account for every word that we speak. So let's be careful. And in fact, instead of grumbling, uh, look at verse 10. He says, Brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Instead of grumbling, think about the prophets in the Bible who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So rather than grumbling, use your voice, use your speech and your words to speak in the name of the Lord. Share the words of encouragement and instruction with people. Tell the truth, share the gospel, and tell people how to be saved and how to have hope because of what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life as a Christian is not going to be a cakewalk just because you're a Christian. It, it certainly was not Amen. a cakewalk for the most perfect person who ever lived, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the one who never did anything wrong, the one who everything he said was said perfectly, everything he thought was perfect, everything he did was perfect, and yet he was put upon a cross by sinful men. And it certainly was not a life of luxury and ease for the prophets who spoke the word of God clearly and consistently and faithfully. In fact, the prophets often suffered because of their faithfulness to God and his word. So arm yourself with the same readiness. Don't expect the Christian life to be a life of ease and comfort and of safety and security. I mean, the longer I live, especially in, in this country, the more there seems to be aimed against me and you as Christians. The world system is opposed to what we believe. And we should just be ready to stand up for what's right, no matter what it costs. That's what the Lord told us that if we are to follow him, uh, to consider the cost of what it means to follow Christ. So these prophets endured a lot and the Bible says that they were blessed. Look at verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, 
and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So when you go through suffering and you go through trials and adversity, do you view it as a blessing or do you view it as, well, God's unfair and he's unjust and just plain mean to me by letting this happen to me? You know, how do you view suffering and trials and adversity? Because Job, who we're told to consider as we go through life, he went through the most difficult experience anyone has ever gone through, as far as I can tell. He lost his family, he lost his home, he lost his health, and just about everything that he valued was taken away. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job or the story of Job, but it's amazing what he went through. But yet after all of that, he exclaimed, the Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Is that your attitude? Is that the way you look at life and respond to events that come your way? And through all of this, it says, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. A lot of people are blaming God today. And you know what? A lot of people are blaming God for things that God's not responsible for. He didn't cause it. He didn't do it. It's our choices, the, the, the things people have chosen to do and believe. God told us in his word, don't do that. He, he's not the one up there pulling our strings and making us do all that. So uh, in all of this, it says, Job did not blame God. In fact, he even had to correct his wife who after all that he had experienced encouraged him to curse God and die. That she just thought it was an easy way out. Just curse God and he'll kill you right here. And he told his wife, he said, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And again, it says in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so as James reminds us here in verse 11, Job persevered and he learned a lesson about God, that God is compassionate and God is merciful. So instead of wasting your breath, grumbling about others or your own life situation, use your breath to praise the Lord and share his word with other people, no matter what it might cost you. In fact, if you remember, as we started our study of James, he told us back in chapter one, verses two through four. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So James is being consistent here with what he's already said. He's just giving us the example of the prophets and of Job to consider as we face trials and adversities in our lives. And then in verse 12, he sort of switches gears a little bit. And he says, but above all my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. You know what he's telling you? He's telling you and me and everyone of us in here, he's saying, be a person of your word. Be a person uh, who is trustworthy and reliable. Don't be someone who has to swear by your mother's grave or by other sayings like cross my heart and hope to die. You should be a person with such a reputation that when you say yes, other people know you mean yes and you're going to do that. And if you say no, they know you mean that too. And they can believe you without you having to engage in swearing gymnastics. So be patient, stop grumbling against one another, persevere and endure when life gets hard. Be a person of your word, be trustworthy, have integrity. And then look at verse 13. He again switches gears and, and he says, hey, is anyone among you suffering? 
let him complain. Is that what it said? Let him do what? Let him pray, right. If anyone is cheerful, let him what? Sing. So when someone within the church, and again, let's think about this, the, the day James is writing and to whom he's writing. When someone in the church is suffering from persecution on account of their faithfulness to work, to, to the word of God, on account of keeping their word as a person of integrity, or for whatever reason, when someone's suffering, let him pray. The person who is suffering should pray before he or she does anything else. Is anyone in the church cheerful? I hope. <laughs> I think the church should be full of happy people. Uh, not always so much based upon life circumstances because they're not always good. But our happiness and our joy should be based upon our hope in the Lord Jesus and what lies ahead for us, amen? amen. So if anyone is cheerful, let him sing unto the Lord and praise his name. But what if you're sick? Well, he talks about that too. He says in verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So let me just point out a couple of things here. First of all, again, prayer is necessary. Prayer is needed here. And the sick person has the responsibility to initiate and call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. It seems like the responsibility is on the uh, the sick person to initiate this, not the elders. Now, maybe that's a technicality, but the, the, the next thing though I want you to see here is that the sick person is supposed to call upon who in the church? What's it say? The elders, right. Is that one person or is that more than one? It's more than one. Now, some people, and I know when I was younger, I used to think this, that I always thought elder meant elderly. <laughs> you know, the older people in the church. But it's not that. It's, it's referring to the pastoral leaders in the church. In fact, in the New Testament, very often the term elder is used interchangeably with the word pastor. And it was the pattern and practice in New Testament churches to have what you would call a plurality of elders in the pastoral leadership of the church. And so while churches get by and occasionally do well with a single solo pastor, the pattern and practice in the New Testament is more than one person holding the pastoral office. So just file that away in your mind for the future because at some point, I want us as a church to consider maybe calling additional people on as elders in the church. Uh, but that's for later down the road. We'll see how the Lord leads in that. But the Bible's pretty clear that there needs to be a sharing of the load of responsibilities between elders and deacons in the church. And so uh, that's, that's one thing. So the sick person needs to initiate and then the sick person calls upon the elders of the church. And then three, praying over the person who requests the prayer means that the elders are to be there with that person in person and even touch that person, anointing him with oil. Now you can't anoint someone with oil without touching them. You do that. Now, the, the, so you have to be there with the person and touch them. And number four, the anointing with oil, what is that all about? It could symbolize the healing and power of the Holy Spirit as the balm of Gilead, the symbolic of the Holy Spirit. That might be all it is, and that's good. But 
Secondly, the instructions to anoint with oil could simply mean for you to just do it because God said to do it. And it might be that simple. You just do it the way he said to do it. You don't have to understand it, just do it. And let me explain what I mean by that, okay? I'm gonna give you three examples from the Bible. Like the Israelites, when they were ready to go into the promised land, they'd been in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they're going and they're right outside of Jericho. And God, when they, when they marched around the walls of Jericho, why did they have to go around the wall quietly once a day for six days and then on the seventh day go around it six times quietly and then the seventh time around shout and blow the horns and strike the drums and make all kinds of noise for the walls to come down why did it have to be that way i mean couldn't god have just knocked the wall down after they marched around it the first time sure he could have so why wouldn't he do it that way? Why make them do it this sort of weird way? I mean, who would come up with this plan? Well, God did. Well, so think about that. Because you know when the, on the seventh day when they went around six times and the seventh time around they shouted and blew the horns and all this stuff, the walls came down, right? All right. So remember that. Next, why did Elijah tell Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, that to be healed from his leprosy, he had to go and wash in the Jordan River seven times? That muddy old Jordan River, which is more like a stream or a ditch in some places, while we have better, prettier, more pristine rivers in Syria than that dirty old Jordan River, and seven times, why seven times? Why not just two times? Why not just one time? But I'll guarantee you that if Naaman had gone to the Jordan River and only went down into the water six times, he would not have been healed because God said to do it seven times. And if Israel would have marched around Jericho and then on say the third day decided to yell and scream and make all the racket with their musical instruments, the wall would not have come down because that's not how God said to do it. What about Abraham? He was told to take Isaac, his only son, and sacrifice him on an altar of wood, the son through whom God said he would bring Abraham myriads of descendants. It made no sense. How can God do that if I take my son up on that mountain, put him up on that altar, and kill him? How's God going to make a great nation out of our descendants? But yet God said to do it, and God said to do it a certain way. So here's where I'm at with this. Perhaps God knows a lot more than we realize. Perhaps there's something about the process whereby we learn more about God and ourselves just because we have to go through it the way he said to. Perhaps in our fast and furious, instantaneous world of convenience, we forget what God says about being patient and waiting upon him and simply doing what we're told and trusting him with the results. Maybe too often, we don't want to be still and know that he is God. We think we've got it figured out, we're smarter than him. If we could just do it our way, everything would be great. But yet, every time we do it our way, we mess up. I mean, why did Jesus need to come into this world anyway? To save us from our stupid mistakes and our sin and all of the trouble that we cause. So listen, we need to stop assuming a role that does not belong to us. We're not God, and he does not need our help. We're not smarter than him. If we simply listen, learn, and obey, we will be blessed by the Lord. Verse 11, we count them blessed who endure. So we've got the prophets, we've got Job, 
In fact, this prayer and anointing with oil, it says, is to be done in the name of the Lord. The Lord is the healer. We can't heal anybody. I can't. Can you? The only reason medicine and science work when they work is because of God and his design and purpose. The laws of medicine and science are discoverable and they're knowable and are useful when used rightly for the good of humanity. God made it that way. And then we come to verse 15, and this can be a hard verse. I'll just be honest with you because it says that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. And verse 15 is a hard verse because you and I both, we all know that we've prayed for people and they haven't always gotten well, at least not in this life. So where verse 15 says that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up, it could mean that God will make someone well and heal them of their sickness so they can continue to serve him on this earth. I've seen him do that. God does make well, he does heal. But it could also mean that the prayer would commend this person to God's care so that whether here or in the hereafter, this person would be healed and raised up. I prayed for a lot of people and they died. But you know what? They were healed. Because they're not sick anymore. They're not diseased anymore. They're not crippled anymore. Whatever you want to call it, they're better than I am because they're with the Lord. And it says, if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven. And maybe this has to do with the sickness that they had. Maybe it was caused by their sinful acts. I don't know, but it says they will be forgiven. If they're his child, they will be forgiven. And then when we get to verse 16, it seems to be a summary for the verses we just looked at. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Don't underestimate what God can do through prayer. When, what God can do when his people pray. It does not take a super Christian to be effective in prayer. And don't underestimate confessing your sins to one another because you know what? We all need help in prayer. And then verse 17, it says that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. You see, Elijah was a man like us. He was a regular guy, nothing special, very ordinary. And he prayed earnestly and we just read what happened, what God was able to do through him. And you can see here in these verses that we just looked at um, that we should not underestimate the power of prayer because we have a powerful God who invites us to pray. The power isn't so much in the prayer, but it's in the one to whom we are praying. And then finally, verses 19 and 20, says, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So James ends up by, by telling us that when we see someone wandering away from the truth, someone wandering away from the fold, someone wandering away from the church, from the Lord, someone from within that church family needs to turn him back and help him to get to a better place in his walk with the Lord. He needs to be turned from the error of his way that's causing him to wander away. And if we do this, the Bible says if we are useful in this effort, we will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. It's good and right and it is noble for us to be involved in the lives of our fellow church members. An individualistic, Americanized Christianity is not what is taught in the Bible. 
What is taught in the Bible is a community of believers who gather for worship, for fellowship, and for instruction so that they can be equipped to do the work of ministry, which includes evangelism and discipleship. And according to the word of God, all this happens within the context of relationships and community, not in isolation and separation. Listen, y'all, we need each other. We need each other. We are a family, we are a body, a group of believers. And that's why Baptists especially have valued and stressed cooperation so much. We can do more together than we can do by ourselves. And that seems to be one of the big lessons that's taught in scripture. And so as we bring our study of the book of James to a conclusion, I want you to see that James throughout our study James has been very consistent, insisting that the Christian life is one of faith, which works. It's not one of just saying you're a person of faith with no evidence. It's your faith works. It shows, it reveals your faith. Um, they give evidence of our faith in the Lord and in his word, and they testify of our hope in the Lord to a watching world. Amen? Amen. I've had a good time going through James and I hope you